Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Kim Brown in Baltimore. Convicted mass murderer and white supremacist Dylan Roof was found guilty on Thursday of 33 charges related to the killing of nine black church parishioners in Charleston, South Carolina. During the trial, federal prosecutors presented evidence of Roof's beliefs in racist values, including Confederate and Rhodesian flags found in his possession. Plus, he claimed to have committed the murders to start a race war because, quote, black people are killing white people every day. What I did is so minuscule compared to what they do to white people every day, end quote. Now, Dylan Roof's criminal actions were extreme, but his views about black Americans and immigrants are representative of how these ideas are increasingly mainstream, the so-called alt-right. And of course, we have seen this presented in President-elect Donald Trump, of course, on the campaign trail, his racist and xenophobic rhetoric, along with some of his selections to his staff and cabinet, have a lot of people concerned. But these are not new attitudes or behaviors in America, but why, in an ever-increasingly browning United States, are these beliefs seemingly on the rise, and what are the roots of it? Well, to discuss this, we're joined today with Dr. Gerald Horn. Dr. Horn holds the John Jay and Rebecca Morris Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's also the author of many books, including most recently, The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America. Dr. Horn, we appreciate you joining us again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, Dr. Horn, how would you categorize alt-right? Is this the same old racism simply repackaged? I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, the alt-right, in many ways, is a euphemism. It sounds like a rock band or a punk band. What we're really talking about is white supremacy. What we're really, really talking about is white identity politics. What we're really talking about is white nationalism. What we're really talking about are descendants of the neo-Nazi movement, descendants of the Ku Klux Klan. We're talking about racists. We're talking about misogynists. We're talking about anti-Semites. This is what we mean when we talk about the alt-right, whether we know it or not. And there's been many expressing alarm um, that someone has been elected to the White House who is cozy with white supremacists, but surely this is not the first time for this in the United States. Well, certainly not. Uh, I find it quite instructive that many people have drawn a parallel between the election of Andrew Jackson, a former slave trader who is on your currency in the 1820s, and the election of Donald J. Trump. Uh, that is to say that uh, that is an apt comparison, whether people realize it or not. Because when you elect a slave trader to the highest office in the land, you're basically suggesting that certain denizens of North America have no rights that the majority are bound to respect. And I'm afraid to say that the election of Donald J. Trump in some ways represents the kind of sentiment that led to the election of Andrew Jackson in the 1820s. That is to say, the propelling to the forefront of politics a certain kind of white nationalism, a certain kind of national chauvinism, a certain kind of bigotry. So, Dr. Horn, how do the alt-right movement, and, and I actually loathe to use that term because it sounds like something, as you mentioned, like a pop band or a rock band. It's a smoothing over of the terms white nationalists and white supremacists. But how, how do the 21st century alt-right movement, what characteristics do they share with white supremacist movements of the past? Well, I think that both movements, that is to say the past and the present of white supremacy, fundamentally feel that this should be a, quote, white man's country, unquote. That is to say that, as Arlie Hochschild, the sociologist at Berkeley, puts it in her recent book, Strangers in Their Own Land, the common ordinary perception of many Trump voters is that those of us who are not defined as white are somehow getting benefits that we did not deserve that we're cutting into the queue, we're cutting into the line, even if we're working hard and paying our taxes, that we somehow do not belong in North America. Now, sadly and unfortunately, many of those who are voting for Donald J. Trump may not hold such raw opinions, but the fact of the matter is that by voting for Donald J. Trump, they're fundamentally endorsing such raw opinions, which means they are complicit in what could turn out to be a massive crime against humanity. 
The Southern Poverty Law Center has tracked hundreds of hate crime incidents since the election of Donald Trump in November. But uh, it, we've seen throughout history there has been these rise and falls in, in racism. I guess it's, it's burned hotter at different points in, in American history than it has others. And I'm thinking of, you know, in the civil rights era, there was um, a visible Klan presence. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan was abducting civil rights workers, murdering them. And we, we had, I want to say, a simmering down, but we didn't see that type of violence towards um, people of color, let's say in the 70s and 80s from citizens. I mean, it could be argued that that anger or that violence, you know, transferred to the police force and it was taken out on communities of color in that way. But we seem to see it heating back up again. What, what does history tell us about these sort of ebbs and flows of how hot racism can burn at, at different points in time? Well, I think one factor that we all need to focus on is the international situation, the international climate. What I mean is that in the 1960s, the United States was on the defensive because it was in the midst of a Cold War where it was seeking to point the finger of accusation at the socialist camp, charging that camp with human rights violations. And in return, the socialist camp pointed the finger of accusation back at the United States, charging the United States with human rights violations because of treatment of peoples of color. Now, with the dissolution of the socialist camp, that kind of international pressure has basically dissolved. And surprise, surprise, with the dissolution of that international pressure, once again, you see the resurgence. You see the propelling of this ultra-right movement that is putting many of us in jeopardy. So let's talk about how this pertains to the potentially incoming administration of Donald Trump. His selection to head uh, the Department of Justice, uh, his pick for attorney general, is Senator Jeff Sessions, a Republican from Alabama who has um, a long history of fighting against civil rights, not only in his own state, but doing so um, from the Senate as well. Um, what does this speak to you about what people can expect in terms of racial justice from this administration? Well, unfortunately, it's not just Steve Bannon of Breitbart News, who is the chief political strategist of Donald J. Trump, now ensconced in the White House, or soon to be ensconced in the White House. It's also, it's, of course, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions. It's also the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, you know, I'm sure, that the Republican majority in the Senate stonewalled President Obama's attempt to appoint Merrick Garland to the seat vacated by Justice Antonin Scalia when he passed away in February 2016. The prospective nominees from Donald J. Trump, I think it's fair to say, will continue the dirty work of Antonin Scalia, which in the first place means gutting further of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It means turning a blind eye to police terrorism it means basically putting the stamp of approval on a kind of reign of terror that will be inflicted upon our community. That's what's in store for 2017 going forward. So let's look at that from the other side of the coin, Dr. Horn. How historically have communities of color responded to in inflamed periods of, of racism? Um, and what should, if you have any advice for communities of color, what should they do in the era of Donald Trump? Well, some things that we've been doing, we need to continue doing. I'm speaking of the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and the rise of mass protests in the streets. But I think what's missing from our movement now is an international outreach. That is to say, taking our case, taking our concerns to the United Nations in New York, to the Organization of American States in Washington, D.C., where it's headquartered. We know that President-elect Trump will seek to deport many people, particularly those of Mexican origin. We have a common concern with the Mexican government, and certainly we need to be sending delegations to Mexico City to help to bolster our international effort. We also know that Donald J. Trump will be seeking to escalate tensions with China. I dare say that China will be seeking to reach out to Mexico because both governments will be in the crosshairs. We need to reach out similarly. 
I think that's what's missing from the recipe that has been concocted by our movement thus far. And Dr. Horn, uh, just to go back for a moment, moment because you referenced uh, the election of Andrew Jackson uh, as an example of a white supremacist being elected to the White House in the 1800s. In the past century, have we seen a comparable white supremacist be elected? So, because a lot of um, you know conservatives or white supremacists would say that you know racism went away uh, after the Civil War, and it, it's been hundreds of years since uh, black people were free or freed out of bondage. But um, in, in the last century or so, who have we seen that could qualify as a white supremacist be elected to the White House? Well, I would point to Woodrow Wilson, who, even though he was governor of New Jersey and president of Princeton University before entering the White House was actually Virginia born and actually was a scholar who wrote some of the most racist histories that this racist country has seen thus far. Recall that it was Woodrow Wilson who screened in the White House one of the first Hollywood blockbusters, uh, speaking of Birth of a Nation, the film produced and directed by D.W. Griffith, which portrays the Ku Klux Klan as heroes who redeem the so-called white South. I mean, I, the, the sad and tragic part is that uh, Woodrow Wilson is not necessarily unique or sui generis. He represents a decided strain in terms of the occupants of the White House, not only with regard to the 19th century, but I'm afraid with regard to the 20th century as well. Indeed. Well, we've been speaking with Dr. Gerald Horn from the University of Houston. He's the author of the most recent book titled The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America. Dr. Horn, we appreciate your insight today. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And thanks for watching The Real News Network.